folks, what I'm going to do today is do my opening intro on nutrition. As I told you before, there's be six parts to the nutrition presentation over the coming months and part uh, as part of a package of 12 presentations that will include culinary skills, concepts, uh, food, pretty much everything that will put the package of Let's Cook Raw in, into more perspective for us so we can see why we do things the way we do them here. And, but we must, we must start out with some basic things. And that includes, of course, what is nutrition and, and how does nutrition work? Is there a way to really understand what makes nutrition work for us? Uh, it's an interesting world. It, it tends not to be the world that most people think it is. Uh, but this is pretty common as we start looking at the raw food, um, raw food world, if we call it that, uh, that there's a lot of misconceptions out there, there's a lot of misunderstandings, there's a lot of slanted influences and, and, and all the stuff that we learned as we got interested in nutrition, as we got interested in, in eating better, uh, improving the quality of our food, we just didn't have a fantastic number of resources from which to pull real information. Uh, so a lot of times the things that we learned about nutrition when we were eating cooked food, actually don't even apply when we're eating raw food. Some of the concerns that cook fooders have don't apply to raw fooders or, or some of the guidelines that we use don't really apply to us at all. Uh, we're not trying to make a small plate of food or limit the quantities in order to keep our weight down. We're not, we're not worried about where do we get our protein? Uh, we have to eat this, that, or the next. We're not, we're not skipping meals in a vain effort to control weight. Actually, most of the stuff we learned about nutrition had to do with weight management, not really nutrition anyway. And so people would tell you, if you do some cardio and deaden your appetite, then you don't have to eat for a few hours afterwards. Well, I mean, that's counterproductive to recovering from working out. You need to eat after you work out in order to make sufficient glucose available for your body to replenish its glycogen supplies. So a lot of what we learned is incorrect and I'm, and I'm not here to talk about the incorrect stuff, uh, nor is it the nature of this presentation to, you know, let's list all of those things, which is another interesting presentation, but it's not this one. Instead, I'd rather focus on what's what's good, what's valuable, what's useful. We're going to look today at protein, fat, and carbohydrate. These are three nutrients that are given different names by different organizations. Uh, in, in older nutrition books, they would talk about macronutrients, micronutrients, proteins, fat, and carbohydrate. In the newer nutrition books, they call macronutrients. The macronutrients used to be the eight minerals that were in big supply in the body, things like iron, uh, calcium, and the like. But now those are just called minerals. Uh, and then the micronutrients today are the things that come in really tiny doses things that didn't even used to be considered nutrients. Uh, there were, there's a class of, of nutrients today that are known as phytonutrients. These are nutrients that come from plants. You don't find them in animals. There's an unknown number, somewhere between 100,000 and 500,000 of these phytonutrients that we think exist. Maybe there's even more than that. None of those are available when we eat Animal products, we get all of those from plants. In fact, when we eat animal products, we only get about 100 nutrients. Whereas when we're 
eating plants were getting somewhere closer to 500,000. Uh, when people ask me like, where do you get your this, that, or the other? And I'm going, guys, there's 500,000 nutrients you're not getting when you're eating mostly animals and animal products. And you're worrying for me about my nutrition, eating plants, I'm getting 500,000 nutrients you're not getting. It's, it's, it's really a backwards view as far as I can tell it. We, we've switched it totally around. It's, it's, the, it's the defensiveness of, does it really have to be organic? And, and prove to me that organic is better when I know full well that there's no way in this world that any mother, any father, or any person would intentionally put poison on their food. They wouldn't put fungicide, pesticide, insecticide, rodenticide. They wouldn't put any kind of intentional use of poison onto their food and yet they want me to prove they know that in the history of the world however long that is depend i don't I'm not get into religion or whatever but but in the history of life on earth which which may cover hundreds of millions of years every plant grown on the earth was organic everything that every animal ate was organic or raised organic and then organic and and organic has been the rule almost exclusively up until the second world war or just after the second world war um, when pesticides were introduced and people are asking me i mean the track record of success in the science of biology is are we still here you know so the cockroaches are successful and the dinosaurs weren't uh, Organic has been successful for hundreds of millions of years. And we've got a 50 year test on adding poison to our food that so far hasn't gone particularly well. A lot of people have been harmed, a lot of people injured. We don't know the cumulative effect. We don't know what's gonna to happen to the next and the next and the next generation after that as the cumulative effect of poisons continues to get worse. So I'm, I'm gonna focus on the on the facts, I'm gonna focus on the positives. I'm gonna, in other words, focus on the goal, go after what I want, rather than telling you what's wrong with what I don't want. That's that's really not the, the point here. And, and with that, I wanna go relatively quickly straight into protein, fat, and carbohydrates, which I will refer to as the three caloronutrients, because these are the only three nutrients that give us calories. Minerals don't give us calories. Vitamins don't give us calories. Uh, the, the enzymes and the coenzymes and the antioxidants and the phytonutrients and the water and the fiber, none of these give us calories unless in their makeup, in their design, there is some protein, fat, or carbohydrate, which essentially does happen on occasion, but not that often. So, so we're going to look at just protein, fat, and carbohydrate as if they were isolated things, which they are not. They're found in all food. Unless those things have been refined out of the food. So if we open a bag of sugar, we won't find fat, we won't find protein because it's been isolated down to pure, pure sugar, what we call an empty calorie. The empty calorie is a calorie source that has been stripped of its associated nutrients. This is a continuum concept where we start with full calories and we can partially or completely in a continuum, remove the various nutrients from the calorie source until we end up solely with the calorie source, at which point we have what is called an empty calorie. Now, I find this interesting that um, the only empty calories being talked about are sugar and white flour. So sugar and starch. Starch being a complex form of sugar, and we'll talk more about that in future, but I find it interesting 
to be presenting to you that there are three sources of calories, protein, fat, and carbohydrate. And then to think that in the world of nutrition, the only thing being talked about in terms of empty calories are the carbohydrates. To me, it makes just as much sense that if we strip all of the calories away from a fat source, say an olive, and we end up with olive oil. In fact, proud on the label, it says pure olive oil, sometimes extra pure olive oil. What they're telling you is there's nothing else in this bottle except a liquid form of fat. There's no protein, there's no carbohydrate, there's no 100 or 500,000 other nutrients, there's just fat, which in my understanding of what is an empty calorie tells me that olive oil is an empty calorie. People are touting olive oil as a health food and other people are saying it's an empty calorie, which is like our, our nutritional nemesis, this are the anti-nutrient of, of the world is to consume empty calories. We want to get away from this. And yet people look at olive oil and they go, and when they hear me say it and they go, yeah, but what about the really good oils? And I go, well, the really good oils are even more pure. They've got more of the nutrients stripped away. They're even less good for us. They're the definition of empty calories, calories without nutrients. Olive oil is the ultimate or any kind of oil. At the same time, we see a huge push in the world. I mean, you can't not be aware of the fact that protein powder is being sold like there's no tomorrow. It's being sold in the mainstream. It's being sold in the bodybuilding world. It's being sold in the fitness industries. It's being sold in canisters bigger than I can carry. It's being sold in the vegetarian world. It's being sold in the vegan world. It's being sold in the raw world. As if protein deficiency was a problem anywhere in the world, which to my knowledge, it is not. In fact, there is no word in the science of nutrition or the science of health for protein deficiency. The term doesn't even exist. Uh, there used to be a term for protein deficiency that was called quashi or core, but further research brought to light the fact that kosher your core was actually a deficiency of calories. And that if we just gave those poor kids some more calories from food, that they actually had more than enough protein, that not that much protein is required. And so the word kosher your core uh, was dropped as indicating protein deficiency. So currently there is no, there is no term for protein deficiency. We just, we just don't, I mean, the condition almost cannot exist except in starvation. So since we're not looking at that as a problem, we really don't have to worry about where do we get our protein, nor do we have to consume excess protein which is an interesting problem that we're going to look at. Protein deficiency doesn't exist, but protein excess, protein overload, protein oversufficiency is in fact a problem. It overloads the kidneys, it overloads the liver. It overloads the joints as a response. Protein by its very nature is typically high in minerals that contain sulfur, which is an acid mineral it makes sulfuric acid. Um, and it has an acidic effect on the body too much protein must be neutralized by the body by the infusion into the bloodstream of calcium. 
The calcium comes primarily from the joints, from the bones. I say from the joints, from the bones. Um, and floods into the bloodstream in order to neutralize the excess, excess protein. But eventually, once the two merge up and neutralize each other, something has to be done with this material. Some of it can be, ex some of it can be eliminated via the kidneys, but some of it can't. And it ends up in the kidneys as kidney stones, all that excess calcium. Some of it is still free floating in the blood and the levels are too high. It becomes dangerous and the body just has to pack it away. And so this becomes uh, various types of arthritis form where we get bony, bony buildups into the joints. Uh, and yet still there can be more if we continue plaguing the body with excess protein and then pulling calcium to neutralize it. And you got to do something with this. And, I, and we have this system of, of arteries and veins that's long enough to go to the moon. And, and we can take all of that and put a little bit of calcium on the inside of that entire lining of 250,000 miles of vessels and end up with what we call hardening of the arteries. Uh, which reminds me like if you didn't know that there was that much you know you could you could actually take all the arteries out of the body and all the vessels out of the body and and line them up in such a way that it would make a tubule that went all the way to the moon and and do you know what would happen to the person if we actually did that they would die if we did that that wouldn't be good um, we have to keep them inside and we have to keep them functional and we can't let the calcium build up on the inside of our arteries because then we get hardening of the arteries uh, we lead to a condition where the arteries can't expand and contract with each heartbeat and so instead they become prone to burst and, and a burst artery is far worse than a, just a burst hose uh, because you then bleed out and depending on where the bleed happens uh, if it happens in your chest cavity, you probably have three more heartbeats, maybe four before you die. If it happens in your brain, you have a bleed and, and then you maybe get six to 12 hours before you die. Uh, it's not a good thing, no matter where it happens. So excess protein is easily as much a problem as deficiency, I, it's got to be more of a problem since deficiency isn't a problem. I find it funny, though. Uh, I've been in many homes, made many meals for many people, or with many people. And a common question that comes up when we're talking about nutrition is where do you get your protein? And, you know, I eat plants, they've got plenty of protein. Elephants eat plants, they get plenty of protein. Cows eat plants, they get plenty of protein. Horses eat plants, they get plenty of protein. I, I'm not worried. Beasts of burden all eat plants. They obviously have plenty of protein. Ox, built like an ox, plenty of protein. Just eats grass. And I'm going to find it humorous. We're going to build on where I started. That this question is typically asked over the food prep part of the meal. We're preparing the food. Somebody's making a salad. They're pouring oil over the salad. That's common. Okay. What's not common is to measure how much oil you pour on the salad. I think even in our audience, if we go, how many people pour the olive oil and how many people put into a spoon and then put it onto the salad? Most people would say they pour. Yes, at least that's been my experience with other audiences. Most people just pour the olive oil. Okay. So the salad itself might have 100 calories, or it might have 200 calories if it's a really big salad. The vegetable portion has 100 or 200 calories. And they're pouring on three, four, five, six, seven, 800 calories of olive oil. The olive oil is being carried by the vegetables. The vegetables are a delivery service for the olive oil, which is the bulk of the meal. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred calories of olive oil is easy to pour on. But the olive oil, if you recall, was 
an empty calorie food, meaning not only did it have no other nutrients, vitamins, minerals, enzymes, coenzymes, and on through that list, but it's also stripped of protein. So while the person is asking me, where do I get my protein? And I get mine by eating plants. So I'm gonna eat a bigger salad than they are. They're putting on a food, the bulk of the calories of their meal, two, three, 400% of their calories. No, that's not good. 40, 60, 80% of the calories of their meal is coming from a food that has no protein. And they're asking me, where do I get my protein when every food in my meal has protein in it? I find this funny and even funnier that when I became vegetarian, the non-vegetarians would ask me, where do I get my protein? And when I switched over to something, pretty much call it macro neurotic, um, the vegetarians were asking the macro neurotics, where do you get your protein? And when I became a vegan, then the vegetarians and the macros are asking me, where do I get my protein? And when I went raw, the vegans are asking me, where do I get my protein? And I thought all those people knew where they got their protein from. And when I became a low fat raw vegan, all the other raw vegans are asking me, where do I get my protein? Meanwhile, I never worry about getting protein. I've been an athlete my whole life. I don't call myself an athlete, really. I'm just an active, I've been an active person my whole life, but I never bumped into a protein deficiency. Um, never had trouble building muscle when that was my goal. It's not my current goal to build muscle, although I'd like to continue to build strength. So what the heck is protein for? Protein serves a primary purpose in the body. Protein is closely associated with growth. And that's basically it. Protein and growth are linked hand in hand. When you think of protein, you think of growth. You got to have enough protein in order to grow. If you don't have enough protein, you will not grow. And that's essentially protein's only claim to fame is protein is associated with growth. We find protein in every plant, in every cell of every plant. Protein is ubiquitous in this regard. And protein is used for growth. Now, a mother's milk is 6% protein. The standard Western diet is about 11% protein. Average protein consumption around the world for the poor, the rich, the everybody else runs around 10.5% to 11% protein. It's almost double what we find in mother's milk. But babies between year one, between year zero and one, grow more than any other time in, in human development and they're on a low protein food granted they eat a little more calories per body weight than we do but darn it i'm not growing at all except in between my ears i'm not growing like i'm not putting on muscle this year i'm going to maintain what i've got but protein isn't part of maintain what I've got. Protein is part of growth. We could, if we really wanted to create a subset of growth because you just bit your cheek while you were chewing something or you cut your finger while you were cutting something or doing something, you're opening a letter and you cut your finger or you stubbed your toe and did a little damage. And so now you need to repair. So if growth was in letters 10 feet high, repair would be in letters one inch high. It'd be like growth and repair. 
be like that. But yes, growth is a subset of, I mean, repair is a subset of growth anyway. So we've got to do some repair all the time, but it's nothing compared to growth. And it's a part of growth. It's, just, it's, it's part of the generic makeup of growth. And, and so what do we need for repair? We need a little bit of protein. The protein deficiency is not an issue. And, and that's to me, the protein story. I often give lectures that are hours long on sports nutrition and never talk about protein because there's nothing to talk about in terms of sports nutrition and protein. But at some point, if somebody is a bodybuilder, and basically bodybuilders are the only people who benefit by adding, by growing in muscle size, they need sufficient protein, but they also suffer if they consume excess protein. More doesn't equate with better in this regard. They just need enough. Why do they consume so much protein typically? Because they don't consume enough carbohydrate to meet their calorie needs. And so they consume more protein, which their body has to then convert into carbohydrate for them so that they can use it for their fuel needs. It's exceptionally inefficient, so you end up consuming more than you need and not having fantastic health as a result. Hence, fantastic number of bodybuilders die of the same few liver-related, kidney-related, heart-related diseases. And pretty much the same ones as everybody else, too. I'll give you time for questions. I won't go as long. I want to look a little bit at fat. And fat is super important. You got to have fat. Nobody lives without fat. I mean, your brain is made of fat to a great degree. When people call you a fathead, they're really not that far off. And it's a fascinating world that for some reason, just because your brain is made of fat, people say, I need to eat a lot of fat to support brain development. Well, as far as I know, your brain already developed. Your brain developed when you were a baby. Your brain developed when you were a fetus. Uh, we look at itty bitty little babies and invariably say, oh, he's so smart. Oh, she's so smart. Look, she can do this, she can do that. They're so smart. My baby's so smart. Well, there's obviously been a whole lot of brain development already happened. And yes, we gain experience as we grow older. We do gain some experience. But is this brain development? Are we still growing brain? I mean, could you imagine how would you fit it all inside your head if it was still growing? No, it's just fat. It just sits there. It does its job. And fat performs one job. Like protein, fat performs one job. That job is insulation. That's all it does. But interestingly, insulation has a whole bunch of subsets. We look at insulation and the subsets of it, and we can say, oh, insulation from hot and cold. When you step outside on an incredibly hot day, for a little while, the body fat on you keeps the heat outside from overheating you. When you step outside on a super cold day, the body fat that you carry keeps the heat inside your body in. So it can work in both directions. When you fall down and land on your bottom, as little kids tend to do, 
they land on a pad of fat. And so their organs are not jarred because the organs are surrounded by little pads of fat and their bottom is coated with a little padding of fat. So against jarring, concussion, and other such hits, the fat works as insulation. Fat in the cells keeps certain things out of the cells and holds other things in the cells. It works as an insulation lining every cell. Fat around your nerves, and again, we've got that same almost 250,000 miles of nerves running through our body. All of it insulated by a layer of fat. Why? Because the nervous messages travel electronically. They're like, an, like a little electric current. It's almost as if your body was wired. And there is a book, The Body Electric. So if there was not a layer of fat on the outside of every nerve, the fat in this case is known as myelin, uh, but myelin is not just fat, there's more to it. And myelin is not just insulation. Myelin is actually active in the transmission of the nerves. And as you learn more things or refine various movements, you increase the amount of myelin surrounding the nerves involved in that activity. So myelin is active. It used to be thought of as inert. It was just insulation, but we actually know now there's more going on and we don't exactly know what that is yet. Things to learn. We know that when you lose the myelin, you end up with a bunch of problems. You end up with things such as muscular sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's amyolateral sclerosis or a bunch of other problems that come from nerve degeneration of the myelin sheath. We know that we can build the myelin sheath, however, and we know that we can destroy it. Insulation electric, like electric wires. Uh, so we're keeping the electric in and we're keeping the water out. The myelin keeps the water out of the nerve so that the wires don't touch water because we know that's always a spark too. It would, you could electrocute yourself. We don't want that to happen. Uh, the insulation happens in as many ways as you can think of it, from shock, from hot and cold, from electricity, from keeping new, I mean, you know, you, you go into water and go swimming and have yourself a nice time. How come you don't become so waterlogged like a sponge does? Because of the lipids, the fats that are in our skin that insulate us and keep the water out. Fascinating world, huh? There's a lot of a lot of detail. And we can make things very complicated. And it reminds me of of the time that the the two famous horse racers, sorry, two famous horse breeders were having the discussion over who breeds a better horse, the English or the Americans. And the English said that they breed better horses because they've been breeding horses for a thousand years. And they figured it out and they've been training horses. They have, they just, they're better at it. I mean, there's no question. When the Americans said, yeah, but, but we do better with nutrition in our horses and, and we know how to train horses to become more physically fit and, and our horses are better. And the only way to solve this problem was have a race. And in the race, it, it turned out that the American horse did in fact win. When the American papers, you know, said the American horse won and the great horse race, the American horse won and the British horse came in second. But in the British papers, they announced that in the great horse race, the British horse 
This is a huge international race. The British horse came in second. The American horse came in next to last. So it's just, how do we present it? And we present the story many ways. People are telling you that oil is health food. You should start your day with a glass of oil um, because it'll get you moving. I mean, it's empty calories, folks. Let's not lose track of empty calories. And how when we got interested in nutrition, one of the very first things we learned is what you see on my shirt, Whole Foods. T. Colin Campbell wrote a book on Whole Foods. I mean, what a deal. We know that Whole Foods, I think there's a store. We, un we understand Whole Foods. And yet we're pouring oil as if it was health food. You can go into the health food store and buy oil. Why? How can that possibly, how can we not see the contradiction and, and be baffled, make better choices, realize that it can't possibly be both. It can't be empty calorie, the world's worst thing, fractionated food, the world's worst thing, and be the be all end all of health is to put in the really good oils. I mean, it can't be both ways. At some point, we have to stand up for what we believe in rather than just falling for anything. Which brings us to carbohydrates. We have to at least discuss carbohydrates in a discussion about protein, fats, and carbohydrates. And carbohydrates also have one function in the body. And I'll have to think, but as far as I know, there's no subsets. Protein even had subsets, you know, and fat had lots of subsets, but as far as I know, carbohydrates primarily are used for fuel. They fuel the body. Carbohydrates are the preferred fuel of every cell in the body. In fact, glucose, a type of carbohydrate, is the preferred fuel for over 90% of the cells in the body. And the other 10% are happy to use glucose, but they can use other things. Glucose is the preferred fuel of the body. When we check blood sugar, we are not checking blood sugar. We are checking blood glucose. And I think it's an important distinction to make. With lactose, fructose, and all the other types of sugars out there available to us, maltose and dextrose and levulose and go on and on. When we check blood sugar, we're only checking blood glucose. When we talk about it, it all we're really looking at is glucose. Our source, fruit. Fruit's the best source of glucose. And we need lots of it. Our body runs on it. If you eat only oil for a week or two, somehow you decide to do an experiment, see if you can live on just oil. You can, but your body will convert the oil into glucose through a process known as gluconeogenesis the creation of new glucose. And if instead you decided to live on just protein powder for a couple of weeks, gosh, how horrible that would be, but you could. You could live on just glucose and your body would convert the protein into glucose. So why not just start with glucose? I mean, you don't put crude oil in your car. You start with the finished product. The body needs glucose. It absorbs glucose under your tongue, directly into your bloodstream. It absorbs glucose in your stomach, directly into your bloodstream. It absorbs glucose in the intestines, directly into the bloodstream. 
to be assimilated and utilized by every cell of the body. Scientists have proved to us that if our fat consumption goes over about 10 to 15% of total calories consumed, predictable health decline ensues. There's been no question there. Scientists have proved to us that not only is 10% to 11% the world average in protein consumption, but that when we consume even that much, and certainly when we go into, into high teens and 20s, predictable health decline ensues. If your protein consumption is only 10% and your fat consumption hovers somewhere around 10%, by default, we can easily figure out how much of our total calorie consumption on average is designed to come from carbohydrates. And it's got to be 80% or more of our total calories on average. Okay, could, it, could you have a 75% day and be okay? Sure. But if you want to work your body harder without contributing to the health of the body, all we have to do is raise protein consumption or raise fat consumption beyond what's required. More is not better. Where we need to go is more carbohydrate. You want to learn about carbohydrate? Well, I could tell you a lot about carbohydrate. I could talk all day about carbohydrate. Basically, there's two kinds of carbohydrate. They're simple and complex. The simple ones taste sweet, and the complex ones have no taste at all. They are tasteless by definition. Open a dictionary. Look up starch. It's a tasteless substance. There's two kinds. Within those, we have what we would refer to as whole or fractioned, refined sugars versus the com complete ones. So if we take a bag of sugar, we have refined sugar, we have an empty calorie, white flour, empty calorie. But if we consume foods that contain carbohydrates, then the these are whole. So we have whole versus refined, we have complex versus simple. Personally, I'm not a fan of eating food that has no taste. So I'm going to not eat complex carbohydrates for any reason ever. But there are industrial uses for complex carbohydrates. Uh, it makes the best wallpaper paste of anything ever. We know that it's paste when we eat complex carbohydrates because the Italians told us they called it pasta. They didn't hide it. The French told us they called it pastry. We called it starch as if that was any different than glycogen, which it is not. Complex carbohydrates in animals are called glycogen. Complex carbohydrates in plants are called starch. Why make it complicated? So that the public can be fooled. I can't come up with any reason other than that to tell you why nutrition is made so complicated. It's to fool the public. When we consume enough carbohydrate to meet our fuel needs, and we sleep enough to meet our energy needs, we've got a match made in heaven. And we can, we can just go and go and go. When we unleash ourselves by reducing fat consumption and protein consumption while raising carbohydrate consumption to meet those for which we are designed, this is when we move forward on all cylinders. This is when we start to get the unleashed feeling that people talk about on the raw vegan diet, especially the low fat raw vegan diet. Is it low as in too low? No, it's low as in comparison to most people who are on a high fat diet, but it is not too low. It doesn't indicate, hey, when you go get a blood test and you've come out low in iron, that's a problem. But a low fat vegan diet does not mean that we're on 
too little fat. It just means compared to all the people eating too much fat. I'm open to questions. We have places to go. I want to talk about a great program that's coming up. It's an exciting day. This is just part one, folks, of what will be a 12-part program, uh, by the end of which you will know more about nutrition than an easy 99% of the people on the planet. And it will be not only understandable, but it will be congruent education that is not riddled with contradictions. Here's to your health.